Hello there, guys, and welcome back to Bright Founders Talk from Temi, an international software development company that designs, builds, and delivers software for sustainable businesses and promising startups. As you can see, guys, we've got our next guest today with us, Joseph Lee, founder of Super Demo. Uh, Joseph, hello. How are you? Hey, good. Thanks for having me. Likewise, thank you for coming on. I see it's nice and bright your side. It's coming to the evening my side. So uh, what time okay. is it over there? Uh, it's uh, freshly 9 o'clock in the morning and calling out of Vancouver or, uh, in Canada. Uh-huh. Nice. What time do you usually start your working day? Uh, I usually start around 8 o'clock. Um, today, I actually went for a, a 10K run around the, around the ocean, which is why I'm a little bit red still. <laughs> I thought that was about 15 minutes ago. Um, usually around 8 o'clock. Uh -huh. Okay. So do you do a lot of fitness? Is this one of the things that you do for your personal health or is it some kind of goal you're working towards? Yeah, I would say it's, uh, you know, maintaining balance uh, and mental sanity. Uh, I found that, you know, exercise, whether it's running or lifting weights or doing kickboxing, snowboarding, it helps you kind of detach from the business and from work, which is, you know, really, really important, uh, you know, when you're so invested and hyper-focused on building, it, it is important to take that step away and focus on your health and having a balance in life. Is this something you've learned over the time or this is something you knew right from the onset? I think it's something I've gotten to be better at. Uh, you know, when I first started my first company, uh, first real company, venture-backed company, back when I was 20 or so, um, I kind of bought into the facade of having to work, you know, 10, 12, 14 hour days and, um, you know, not have interest or focus on anything else in life but the business. Uh, and that kind of got me down a pretty dark uh, spiral physically and emotionally and and, and mentally. So, you know, over the years, I think I've, I've, I've done a much better job at kind of tuning back and having more of a balance. Um, yeah. Nice. We will talk about that and uh, your challenges and your journey a little bit later on. But I want to know, before we get started, tell me, I always like to start these interviews with uh, something to get to know the person behind the machine a little bit more. Tell me something about you, which not many people would know about you, except that you did a 10K this morning. Not many. Uh, know that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think some people, I think a lot of people do know about this, but this is a, a fun fact. Um, you know, my first venture backed company that I started, it was uh, North America's first demand driven marketplace for seafood. So what that entailed was, uh, you know, we connected commercial seafood harvesters, fishermen, uh, seafood company is directly to uh, high-end restaurants. Mm -hmm. We manage all the logistics in between of getting fish from point A to B to C to D. So I know a surprisingly a lot about the seafood industry and how seafood moves. Um, and I personally transported over probably 100,000 pounds of seafood myself. Wow. Uh, we started off by buying a Ford, Ford pickup truck and, and driving down to the docks, picking them up and driving them down to the restaurants ourselves. So um, that's a fun little backstory of how I got started in entrepreneurship. Absolutely. We will go into that in a little bit more. Before we do, just tell me in a couple of sentences, what is it that you're doing there at Superdemo? So I'm a co-founder and CEO of Superdemo, and we help anyone create beautiful interactive product demos and guides in seconds using AI. So, you know, anyone with a product or a workflow, if they wanted to demonstrate that, they simply turn Chrome extension and walk through the uh, the flow that they want to demonstrate, and we transform all of the clicks and steps and slides into an intuitive click through demo that can be you know embedded on support docs, onboarding, uh, your sales playbooks, websites, product nice. blogs, et cetera, et cetera, to really you know uh, showcase uh, your product in the best light rather than you know forcing people to go down a paywall and sign up for a demo and all that uh, all that salesy stuff. Was this um, something out of personal use, which you came up with the idea? How did you come up with the idea? Because a lot of the best uh, startups from the guys and the girls that I've interviewed, uh, they are. it was a situation when they needed something, couldn't find it, no one else was doing it, let's go do it myself. What about you? Yeah, it was a, it was a twofold, um, you know, Genesis story. So, you know, on my side, after we had pivoted from, uh, you know, the seafood marketplace, we ended up building this B2B sales enablement platform for food distributors and wholesalers mm -hmm. to sell more effectively uh, to restaurants. 
And that was a byproduct of COVID kind of decimating our, our seafood business. And when we had transitioned from this B2B seafood marketplace to an enterprise SaaS product, we suddenly had to do a lot of cold calls. Um, and we had to kind of uh, hit the pavement and try to get folks onto demos. And one of the struggles that we really had was you know, we were building a very esoteric, complicated product with a lot of bells and whistles. It was really hard to describe to maybe a tech nascent or non-tech native crowd of a distribution plant owner or a wholesale owner, for example. Um, so we had a really hard time explaining you know, what we did and our product benefits in just words uh, or videos that just simply wouldn't get watched. Um, but what I noticed was when I was able to get them on this one-on-one -on -one screen share session and kind of click through step-by-step -step how our product worked and how it tied to you know some of the pain points that they had at the warehouse, that's when they got that light bulb moment. And they were like, holy crap, I need this myself. How do I sign up? Um, so as an entrepreneur, as someone that is always thinking of new ideas, you know, I kind of kept that in my back pocket as something that I wanted to explore because, you know, I scoured the internet and I didn't personally find too many solutions that were apt being able to leverage. Um, and then eventually I met my co-founder Kaushik, uh, who actually had built kind of a digital agency for about six and a half years. And, uh, you know, one of the things that he did for a lot of his clients like Facebook and Xiaomi was uh, creating product demos and creating, you know, explainer videos. Uh, that would shine their yeah, kind of bread. It's in the best light. Um, so he was very much in tune with the opportunity and the problem of that taking a week, two weeks and costing thousands of dollars. Um, and he had started kind of experimenting and starting to build out, um, you know, the the early version of Super Demo. And when we came together, uh, we kind of jived. I almost immediately knew that he was the right co-founder for me, uh, having done a lot of co-founder cool matching and dating and meeting a lot of people. Um, yeah, I had an immediate uh, conviction in Kaushik and his ability to deliver, and then we teamed up, and the rest is history. Tell me a little bit more about that partnership. It's a really difficult thing to find is a, a co-founder. We were talking just before we came on air about how lonely it can be as a founder, but also co-founder has its difficulties and its challenges as well. How did you find each other? And what would be your advice to the other startup uh, founders listening to this podcast now mm -hmm. how to find their co-founder? Personally, I, I think it's really important to turn co-founder matching and co-founder searching into a process. Um, so I actually had a very methodical step-by-step -step kind of playbook that I created of where I was going to source potential co-founders, how I was going to you know, assess it both in terms of the character, personality, and skill set. Um, and that goes both ways. They could assess me and I could assess them. And then have some sort of trial agreement where we could actually, you know, put our skills to the test and put ourselves in kind of a, uh, you know, emulating a stressful or like a pressure packed environment where we had to deliver sort of outcome. Um, and then that could be a really good determinant of how we would work together. So, uh, funny enough, I, I wrote this playbook uh, in a blog and I shared it in, I think it was the Entrepreneur's Playbook. So happy to link it in the blog uh, or in the video for anyone uh, interested. Absolutely. That would be really helpful. Most definitely. You would take that off you. Um, okay, cool. Uh, tell me a little bit more about uh, your experience and your experience to then help you build uh, Super Demo. So what did you take from all of your, you've got quite a diverse background from doing some research on you, quite a diverse background, huge amount of experience and quite a lot of things you were saying about the, the fishing industry as well, the fishing business. Um, tell me, what have you been able to take from all of your, um, all of your uh, experience to what you're using today? Yeah, I think, you know, regardless of what type of business you end up building, whether it's you know, a B2B marketplace like I did or, you know, enterprise SaaS product or mm -hmm. We're building a product-led growth uh, SaaS company. Um, the core of what you do in entrepreneurship is all the same. It's really, you know, navigating and, and identifying a big enough opportunity and a problem that is worth solving. And once that problem is worth solving, having some sort of hypothesis or a vision of the future of, you know, who you could impact and what you could build and navigating uncertainty. 
right? And entrepreneurship is all about taking imperfect information and chiseling and chipping away at it and trying to get more and more of a complete uh, picture. So regardless of what kind of company you start, whether it's in fishing or healthcare, the crux of it is is that, right? You have a vision for the future. You don't really know how to get there. You have a thesis and uh, you build out a, like an amazing team and you build out a hypothesis on how you can get there step by step. Yeah. Nice. Really, wow. Okay. Tell me a little bit more about your approach to entrepreneurship. What is your approach and has there been anything that's helped you? Has there been um, maybe like a role model of books? What has been the biggest help to you? I think having a really good group of advisors and peers is always important. Um, you know, a lot of people say you're the sum of your parts. Um, and not. Your network really does accelerate your growth and ambitions. Um, I've been really lucky in the sense that I've been in a lot of accelerators and entrepreneur communities where I've been able to rely on friends, mentors, advisors, investors um, during both good times and really hard times where, you know, there have been times where we were at the precipice of like shutting down and wow. the investor saying, hey, like, I get it. It's a hard grind. Building a business is not easy. If you want to shut it down, um, I support you. And having someone say that to you uh, and kind of help you help mentor and, and help you navigate through those kind of troughs of sorrow, um, you know, it it can make or break, I think, your your uh, ability to find success in entrepreneurship. How to cope with that stress, uh, Joseph? How do you actually cope with the amount of pressure on your shoulders, especially once the business comes and gets up and running, you've got uh, members of your team who you need to pay. How do you cope with that stress? That's an ongoing challenge, right? I don't think there's one answer. I, I still struggle with that all the time. Like physical activity is one thing I do to try to, you know, tune out and um, be level-headed. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge because I think um, when you have higher expectations of yourself and what you want to achieve in life, I think that stress and that motivation and that drive inherently, it's always going to be there. You just need to channel it into something that is productive. So you don't want that stress to weigh you down and get you negative. You really have to kind of change your mindset and channel that stress to be like a positive motivator. And at the end of the day, just remind yourself that it's you're living the same life as everyone else. Like everyone has one life. Um, you know, you just do the best you can. And if things don't work out, like what is the worst case scenario? Not, it's not that bad, right? You learned a whole ton. You got to build something and make thing. You got to take, um, take a leap of faith and, and do something really, really unique. Um, in the worst case, you have a really cool story to tell, uh, in the future. It's very true. Joseph, tell me a little bit more. Uh, you were saying at the beginning there that uh, you were quite entre entrepreneurial right from the beginning. Um, yeah. You, you said at 20 years of age was when you uh, set out on your first adventure. Um, tell me a little bit more about this and what was the kind of challenge you have faced the most by being a young entrepreneur? Is it maybe at such a young age, do people not take you so seriously? What have been those challenges? Honestly, I think over the probably over the last, 20, 30 years or so, startups have become so romanticized and commonplace. Mm. I haven't personally faced the feeling of being underlooked or not being trusted within, you know, uh, a community of maybe people that are more experienced or, or more prestigious. Um, that could be different maybe in like the medical field or, you know, in hard tech, for example, but in software, um, uh, it's actually been very celebrated. So uh, a lot of mentors and folks that have found success love to help younger entrepreneurs because they see a little bit of themselves uh, in the founder. So uh, that's actually been a benefit more so than a than a challenge. Um, when you're first starting off, I think um, the challenge is prioritization and figuring out what's important. There's a million different things you can do and you eventually need to do to find success in entrepreneurship. But 
realistically speaking, you can only focus on a handful of things at a time to move the needle forward. So instead of trying to do 20 things, you know, at a, at a mediocre pace, you want to focus on the top three, the top five things that are bottlenecking your business from growing and focus all of your efforts on doing that. But when you're first starting and you're wearing different hats and you're trying to do everything, it can be really hard to have that so this. That's, that's one of the biggest, uh, the most often used phrases, which I hear from uh, all of the speakers on our podcast is about the wearing the, the different hats and wearing so many hats at the beginning and the challenge with it. Can you be uh, an entrepreneur if you don't like to multitask, if you can't multitask? Is it possible to be one? A good one. <laughs> I guess it's possible to be one. I think the characteristics of every good entrepreneur is they're malleable and they're adaptable. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think you can't, you just cannot be a specialist in like a founder role. Uh, In an early stage employee role, perhaps you can, but so much of entrepreneurship is again, having the mission and, and, and vision of where you want to be, but the journey can wind and bend in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, where you need to be able to do everything. You you need to plug the holes. You need to fix the leaky buckets all across the business. And that is going to take someone having to do like marketing and growth and sales and, you know, um, HR or being the janitor, uh, a series of, of many different jobs. And um, I personally haven't seen any entrepreneur that, doesn't have this adaptability and malleability, um, I think it's a pretty core skill set to have. And wait, let's go back to the beginning a little bit. So uh, when I was doing some research, I saw that in five months, you went from zero to 2,000 users. Tell me a little bit about this experience. What was the challenge with that came with that? That's great, great with success, obviously, but the amount of um, that huge jump from zero to 2000 in just such a short time brings its own challenges. How did you cope? What did you cope with? Luckily, I think it's, you know, we have the type of business that is inherently viral and there's a viral loop embedded into the core of our product, right? Mm-hmm. When somebody eats an interactive product demo or an interactive walkthrough guide, uh, the first thing they want to do is share with their colleagues. Uh, we're embedded in you know high traffic areas like websites, support docs, onboarding. They want to amplify the impact of what they've created. So there hasn't been too many challenges with scaling that growth. Um, you know, in fact, I think it's been about eight months or seven months since we launched, and now we're at about four thousand users, so wow. more than double, mm-hmm. um, and and probably tripled the number of paying customers or quadrupled. But I think uh, the big thing is you know the challenge is how do you go from more of a standalone indie-esque product, uh, you know, that two people are running. And how do you now navigate the enterprise and, um, you know, full-fledged expectations that paying customers have from uh, like an enterprise-grade product? Sure. Um, so we have customers paying thousands of dollars. So, uh, you know, as a result of that, what they expect is, you know, performance, good customer support, um, you know, nothing's crashing. You have a beautiful user experience and interface, um, and you have a constantly evolving product. I'm trying to manage those expectations, uh, and and make sure that everyone has a rock solid experience is is a challenge from going from like a, you know a, a hundred user product to mm-hmm. some uh, five thousand, ten thousand, twenty thousand users. Absolutely, Joseph. Tell me a little bit um, more about the team. So. In those eight months, how much has the team grown? Uh, it hasn't yet. Uh, uh, wow. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's uh, my, my co-founder, Kaushik, uh, and I uh, leading the team. And we've been pretty deliberate to, you know, to wait until we find the right team members to grow the team. Um, you know, I've been and I've scaled organizations where we have, I guess, scaled headcount for the sake of scaling headcount because, uh-huh. you know, Sometimes it just comes with the territory of uh, raising cash. Um, so as a you know a second time or a repeat founder, um, I know how important it is to you know build the right culture and bring in the right first hire. So um, we've been methodical uh, to not 
We are in the process of hiring now um, across a few roles in growth and engineering. So uh, if anyone is watching this and uh, the timing, so feel free to reach out. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. We'll definitely need the link uh, under the, uh, the video as well. Joseph, we are talking about AI at the beginning and how you utilize AI. Tell me a little bit more about this. And also, I want to go to the next question whilst we're here. Uh, where do you think uh, AI is going to be able to enhance your company the most? How is it going to be able to enhance yeah. your company the most? The one thing I love about the application of AI in Superdemo is, you know, unlike a lot of different tools and products that are generating a lot of hype, you know, we're not building a solution in search of a problem. We have a proven business model that has now been adopted by thousands of people. They're loving it. Uh, they're, you know, delighted by the value that, you know, Superdemo brings to the table. Uh -huh. AI has that opportunity to amplify everything that we do um, within the product demo space. Sorry, my cat. <laughs> um, so, you know, some of the things that we're now looking to roll out and we're currently building is, you know, how do we build um, a system where all of the text annotations and snippets that a company, you know, where a customer clicks uh, is auto-generated with AI personalization or AI recommendations based on, you know, who the customer is, who the person is that is creating the demo and what their product is, where they're clicking in terms of the HTML DOM element and what they're do what their motivation is and giving them the opportunity to create this world-class high fidelity very polished product demo or a walkthrough guide um in two minutes or three minutes instead of it taking 20 minutes so that's one area we're looking at um another one is how do we unlock the ability for customers to you know overlay you know synthetic or or, or ai audio on top of all the slides so uh, they're accomplishing what they would have done in kind of a screen recording session with their voice and, you know, uh, screen recording. But instead of it taking three, four, five takes because they're clicking the wrong spot or they have to have a script ready or they screw up their voice, now they're generating that in an instant in two, mm -hmm. three minutes. Again, instead of it taking uh, a very long time. So uh, there are so many different possibilities, whether it be automatic, translations or internationalization, um, things of that nature that we're really, really excited about. Um, so we're just at the precipice and the, the early stages of our journey. Um, so excited to keep working on this and building and innovating. In regards to looking back to when you were 20, when you started out on your entrepreneurial um, adventure, what do you wish you knew then, which you know now, which could have helped you so much back then? Trusting your gut and having a bias for action and being quick to make hard decisions. I think there were times, for instance, where at the very early stages of our company, it was pretty evident from a gut feeling that we had to pivot like pretty drastically in order to find success. Mm -hmm. But having raised venture capital and having kind of instilled this vision and ethos to the team, we were hell bent on kind of going down that path and not doing a drastic pivot. And, you know, what that ends up doing is wasting a ton of time and resources and time is the most valuable thing, right? In a startup. So um, making that tough call and being quick to take action is really, really important. Same thing with employees. There were times where, you know, we hired folks and they were just immediately not a good fit, you know, and they were um, a really, really bad culture fit and they were um, almost poisoned right, to to other employees. Um, and they were a, a hindrance to us building our culture and an atmosphere of of engagement and support and, uh, and empowerment. And we probably dragged our feet um, trying to give this employee a chance. Yes. And we gave them one chance, we gave them two chances, we gave them three chances. Um, and ultimately, it ended up negatively impacting other members of the team. Um, but, but, so you mean better better not give a chance? Is this what you mean here? Better make the decision at the beginning and then move on. I think it's very, I think most of the times your gut feeling is right. Um, I do think it's important to give people a, a chance to improve, but 
you know, you also shouldn't give infinite chances. And Absolutely. sometimes you need to uh, trust your gut. And, um, you know, these are these are some of the lessons that we learned, right? Um, as a result, I think, for example, when we pivoted from Coastline, which is our first company where we were doing kind of mid, mid seven figure revenue um, every year, um, and, and we were in the midst of our uh, preparing for a Series A, uh, when the pandemic hit, as a yeah. result of a lot of these uh, kind of lessons that we learned, we were able to pivot like that in a month, build a brand new business, brand new business model, and scale it up to a profitable uh, profitable level. And if we didn't go through those lessons um, of having indecision, we probably you know wouldn't have pivoted as quickly the um, you know, second time around. Joseph, thank you so much for coming on today for uh, Black Founders Talk. It's been amazing to pick your brain. Um, and guys, anyone looking um, and fascinated and inspired by what they're doing at Super Demo, we'll leave the links below the video as well. So for you to, uh, to apply and see if you are the culture fit, most definitely. Uh, Joseph, thank you very much for coming on. It's been great. Thanks for having me.